Yang berhormat Datuk Seri, we will begin the session with a short video on the problem statement of corporate governance in Malaysia. What is corporate governance and why does it matter? Simply put, it is the system that deals with the running of company and controlling the actions the persons involved. Its objective is to increase wealth and improve decision making in the company while protecting the stakeholders' interest in the business. Good corporate governance improves accountability and makes company more efficient, competitive and attractive for investors. In contrast, bad corporate governance poses risks and may contribute to the company's losses. A very good afternoon, everyone. Uh, welcome, YB. Uh, let me introduce my panelists today. Uh, we have to my left uh, Mr. Datuk Mark Rosario, who is the CEO of General Electric Corporation in Malaysia. Of course, YB, who you all know, and to YB's right, um, uh, Mr. Asalan, who is HSBC CEO of HSB Amana. Uh, I, I think the key in one of the discussions we're having is corporate governance. Is it driven by the private sector or through the corporates, or is it driven by government, might be? Or is it actually all of us in this room that drives corporate governance and the change is what we're talking about? In essence, it is society that defines what is the norm or what is appropriate. Now, I think the key thing is we're on a journey and clearly in Malaysia, Baru, it is we're taking corporate governance very seriously, we always have, and corporate governance manifests itself in many different ways. Uh, one of the questions we ask, and perhaps I think, Oz, I'll pass it to yourself, is, is corporate gov what, what does corporate governance mean to the man in the street? Or what is the journey that corporate governance, particularly in the HSBC context, as a leader in the space, and a highly regulated business, of course, in banking, the footprint you have means you have a number of different jurisdictions that you operate in. So is it enough to do what your regulators want? Is that what drives HSBC or is it something far more than that? Thank you very much. Uh, Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. And uh, I have to admit, uh, thank you for all staying all the brave souls here to spend uh, 3 p.m. onwards talking about corporate governance. Uh, so, yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, when we talk about um, corporate governance, let's go back in time and understand where it came from. Uh, it's been around for a long time, but popularized in the 1970s through what was called the Penn, uh, Penn Central Railway. What actually happened is there's a very successful railway company in the United States in the 1960s, and in the 1970s, it started diversifying what it was doing and went bankrupt. And this is the first time that publicly board of directors were directly implicated uh, in the aftermath of it. And historically, what corporate governance was around was saying there are shareholders who delegate responsibility to a board of directors who negotiate with executives to run a business. And you have three aspects there, shareholders, board of directors, and management. And what corporate governance typically was is ensuring an arm's length relationship between the three uh, to make sure that the agency issue between what the shareholder wanted to get done uh, was done effectively by the management. And that's all corporate governance was around, and we went through lots of different changes to answer the question specifically. Yes, regulators are very important, therefore HSBC complies, Amana, with the uh, BNM, with also HKMA, and also the PRA, where our parents, parent, and parent are regulators, and we take the best of what those three say. But that's all a bit of a kind of technical point. Where does our conscience for our corporate governance come from? Well, that actually doesn't just come from the regulator. It comes from the purpose of the organization, HSBC's purpose. It comes from the expectations of our employees. It comes from the expectation of our customers and other advocate groups. So that's how 
our corporate governance is built. Um, and I think that raises an important question, um, that a, uh, Umar, which is, is that all it should be going forward? And how do you make sure internally um, you have the best actors? So that's what I just kind of say as an opening. Thank you, Ross. I, I mean, clearly there's an interesting piece there. Uh, governance, the role of the board, the role of shareholders. Um, I think we'll just park the role of significant minority shareholders, particularly in a Malaysian context. If you look at Penn State, you had many small shareholders and the company had that outcome. In Malaysia, we have a slightly different circumstance. We have many of the entities listed on our boards have significant minority shareholders who clearly, when we talk about governance and independence, potentially they actually have significant influence on the composition. Uh, I think perhaps if I may, YB, I'm just going to direct this question to Mark. What are your thoughts re regarding around board composition, governance, and again, also your thoughts is what is the role of society's expectations on driving that governance and change? Thanks, uh, Umar. Uh, well, if you look at a company like, like GE, the, the tone for corporate governance is, is, is set at the top. I mean, every company has their corporate governance statement. And if you look at uh, the corporate governance statement of, of uh, GE, it's probably no different from what you see in many listed companies here. It's just about the application. Now, um, so we, we've got uh, all those, those statements about board composition, how the board operates, how the different the various committees operate but it permeates right through the company. Every single employee has to go through, uh, when they come on board, I joined GE about two and a half years ago, and I had to take these tests on, on, on corporate governance and compliance, how you deal with uh, government officials, how you deal with suppliers, and uh, there's no if or buts. You have to do it, you have to answer every question correctly or keep doing it again, and uh, it's taken very seriously in its application. There are no exceptions, and uh, you know, in, in things like like tendering, we would walk away from a deal if if there's anything uh, you know that that wasn't wasn't going right or wasn't done done uh, correctly. And sometimes that puts us at a disadvantage, uh, particularly if you're dealing with with uh, companies from other countries that may not have uh, similar standards of, of uh, integrity and compliance. Um, but end of the day, it's, it's really how the tone is, is, is set at the top. Now, when you talk about board composition, it's, um, I think this is certainly an aspect that, that, that needs, needs to be looked at because how, how do board uh, directors get appointed? Uh, a lot of the time, if, if you look at uh, uh, large corporates in, in the US and elsewhere, large MNCs, the shareholding structure is very different from what you see in Malaysia. Typically, uh, you wouldn't have any single shareholder holding more than, than 5% or 10% at, at most. I'm talking about very large uh, MNCs. GE, for example, the largest single shareholder has 7%, and the next one is 5 There's only a handful with, with uh, uh, you know, those, those sorts of uh, shareholdings. Whereas in Malaysia, well, 60% of, of uh, companies listed on, on Bursa uh, are actually government controlled. Uh, and when you look at uh, some of the larger uh, other non-government non controlled companies, Many uh, uh, individual uh, shareholders who control those companies. So how do the boards get appointed? Really, it's, it's either the, the government appointees or the individual uh, controlling shareholder actually introduces, uh, even the independent, so-called independent directors are, are brought in that way. Now, when you talk about board composition, I, I think it's really important to, to look at what are the skill sets required rather than uh, who knows who. 
in this day and age especially, if you, if you need to make sure you have board members that, that are aware of technology, are aware of uh, what's happening in, in, in the digital world. Every company now is, is facing potential disruption. Right? You, you, no matter what industry you're in, telcos now are all looking at changing their business model. They're all becoming IoT companies. We see that in, in Malaysia now. That the, a few of the large telcos are, are really pivoting their business model. And, and why is that? It's, it's because disruption is going to come. And you need to have board members who are able to, to uh, give their input and give their views as to how the company, when you talk about strategic plans, you should not just be relying on the CEO to come out with a strategic plan. The board needs, needs to give their input. Because um, disruption is going to come, and if you're not able to see what's coming, you know, the whole, whole uh, business may, may go out the window. We don't want to end up like another, uh, I mean, a typical example is, is Kodak, right? What happened with Kodak? They invented the digital camera, but they didn't want to disrupt their film business. And where's Kodak now? It's gone. Thanks, Mark. I think there's some interesting themes. Um, perhaps the key, though, and, and we've all touched on it, tone from the top might be. And I think we, we have a very clear tone from the top. That's why we're here today. And that tone from the top, if, if you care to elaborate and share with us a little bit, because clearly um, it is, was ex conduct. Uh, how do we drive conduct that is acceptable. The values that society has is then, if you like, and it's driven, which Mark touched on, and Oz, if you look at HSBC's lending practices, to be not picking on anyone in particular, Oz, but um, you know, we, we don't do coal anymore. This is actually driven by investors. It's driven by society. And again, that also then reflects back how we value what we do and how we do, but it's very much the tone from the top and the talent that we bring to the table. Governance from the top. I think um, pendapat saya lah, my, my, my opinion on this, GE, Hong Kong Shai Bank, Bursa, have different set of governance perhaps. Fit for purpose maybe, but the basic fundamentals has to remain. Now, it's all go back to the people. What the people wants to see. What the people want to benefit. So in the case of me as a minister, we hear a lot of feedback from the masses. We are what we call the elected representative. And for me, personally, I'm fortunate to be part of the administration, and we see many things that we can do better with regard to try to institute governance, SOPs, and so on. Now, we formulate those based on the behavior of the people, based on, as I say again, the values that we want to promote. To Notamade said earlier, it's all about values. Now, we picked up those values for the different people to congregate, to set up, to set up certain standards of operating procedure, to make sure things are done in the proper manner that fulfill the aspiration of what people want. That's why different countries, as you see, has got different achievement. So you got different set of values, try to congregate to fulfill the aspiration of the country, in particular the nation. Yeah? Now, today you hear stories, big stories, or in the past, you've got big names, even when you talk about a recent uh, case on Goldman Sachs, recent case on Enron, um, Gosson, all these stories came up. These are intelligent people. These are good people. These are people that have got to carry good values. But why governance are not followed? Why there are breaches in operating procedure? Why they resort to corrupt practices, for example. So, to me, again, Omar, Dr. Omar, when we identify people, 
we only see their values on the surface. The outcome or the impact will it become the in the in, when you have an organization even like Bank Right, yeah, it's a congregation of different people with perhaps a different set of values. We try to keep to bring them to the we we try to bring them to the same level, same platform based on what we want. So we have to get the right people to do the right job, and then you measure the impact. If you don't do that, <clears throat> if you don't get these people that presumably has got values to carry out the task that has been entrusted by the government as a policy makers, then you can see what you have seen. So I don't have to state anymore. Fundamentally, governance comes from people. We will identify the right people, we have the right values, and let these people formulate SOPs that can fit certain environment in the case of your association and your organization and GE as well as Bursa. I'm pleased to note today that Bank Rakyat is initiating this effort to bring the awareness to people how important that governance be followed. Thank you. My big. And of course, thank you, Ben Craggart, for making this initiative to actually bring forward this debate. And I think it's a very important debate. Um, Oz, your thoughts around change and leadership? And I mean, clearly, and don't be embarrassed, I'd like to share that Oz in 2016 was the youngest CEO of an HSBC bank, which clearly means you have a very interesting take on the different the generational shift between the values that have been changing because banking as you can clearly see by some of the failures that we've had has been very profit based and now has been moving to a more ethical space and your thoughts around that so it's it's um it's a very important shift so um i i don't think the following is a good statistic that in the banking sector in Malaysia, I'm still the youngest CEO. And I don't think that's a good thing, by the way. And, and the reason I say this, sorry, I'm going to be 40 on the 28th of January. So this month, I'm going to be 40. I know it's, it's a big thing for me to deal with, actually. I'm, I'm coming to terms with it. Um, You're older than some prime ministers in, in other countries. Right, <laughs> exactly, yeah. I, I'm, I'm getting super old. Um, so the reason I think this is important is that we... We have to recognize that over the last 40 years, the people who were successful in the banking sector, and I'd argue in any commercial sector, were people who focused on the bottom line. And the people who are going to be successful over the next 40 years are the people who are going to focus on the triple bottom line, which is not just economic prosperity or profits, but people and planet. So actually, when I was early talking, earlier talking about corporate governance looking after shareholder, board of directors, and management, I was actually talking about they all care about prosperity and profit. Where is the societal and environmental representation in that trio? It doesn't exist, and it needs to exist. So value-based intermediation is something that the central bank is driving for Islamic banks, um, but actually it's an agenda that everybody should be driving. We need to change the mindset, and the problem is, is that the mindset that has prevailed across now seated you know, in boards and senior management positions and people who report to them are all focused or have been brought up, have been habitualized in this idea of maximizing profit without understanding who are the wider set of stakeholders in the communities we serve and the environment we live in. We don't look at that. So actually, hats off to uh, Madame Chairperson of Bank Riot. And as a, you know, as a competitor, I can actually say that. It's it, to make such a clear statement of intent for the bank um, and actually represent um, something that's much further ahead that hasn't been reached is also very important. We can't just represent the general sentiments of progress which will get us to the average. We need individuals to stand out as a gross caricature of where we want to get to. And then, we, then people need to embody those progressive practices and those pro progressive positions with all, all of the decision-making structures from the board, the shareholder, the management, and their reports who are uh, delegated responsibilities to execute. And I think that that is a fundamental shift that can 
uh, be encouraged. <clears throat> oh, so if I just want to canvas your thoughts. Change of lending practices towards sustainability. That's clearly not a short, I mean, that's, that would hurt profit in the short term. And so you have to take a much longer term because, uh, if I may, why be with your indulgence, um, well, the corporate governance is actually a subset of sustainability. And I'm not trying to go off piece, if, if I can. But clearly I'm interested in how did the bank go on this journey where potentially some of the decisions you're going to be making short term hurt your profit. But then again, they're driven by investors who could be perhaps perceived as a investors in HSBC PLC. Are they a proxy for society and society's values? So I think this is really important. We've got to get away from the conversation that sustainability is um, a long-term play. It's not. It's objectively not. It's not just it's not because we don't like the idea. It's not. It's objectively not the case. So for example, if someone goes and issues in the international markets in hard currencies, a capital markets issuance, um, where they're able to issue a green issuance uh, and get more investors, effectively their pricing becomes better. So that's an economic impact, day one. If we understand who universal investors are, so if we look at the multi-trillion, so say it's the kind of, I think it's 70 trillion, 70 trillion dollars um, that is managed, out of that, um, I think the top 30 fund managers manage that, of that 6.5 trillion is um, BlackRock. If you look at all of these universal investors, they cannot diversify away um, social and environmental impact Therefore, they are pushing for more ESG-related investments in what they do. The universal investors of Malaysia are Quap, EPF, Khazana. They can't do this. They can't diversify away the climate and societal risk. So there is no short-term loss in doing this. In fact, there's short-term gain in doing it. So I think that, that's quite important. The problem is directors and management all still think this is a long-term play. And you're not going to get that mindset change, and that mindset has to be changed. Otherwise, it will be, as Dr. Mark said, it will be disrupted. I've been mean, very much, that's our views at Bursa, of course, but that's a plug for foot, FTSE for good, <laughs> which is why I asked the loaded question. You, well, I think this is also where uh, this, the concept of integrated reporting uh, comes in. And uh, in my in my previous life, when, when I was running the innovation agency in, in the government, we were pushing this, this uh, issue of how uh, companies should be looking at, at investing in innovation and how you um, need to look at uh, all aspects of, of uh, intangibles in, in, in the company. And all this forms part of, of, of the integrated reporting. Uh, many, many companies don't even, uh, aren't even aware of what sort of uh, intangibles they have uh, in, in the company. And, and this cuts across everything, you know, from intellectual capital, or human capital, uh, everything like your, your branding, your processes, all this forms part of, of, of the assets of the company. And it's, it's surprising that so many companies don't even know that, what, what actually uh, forms part of the and, and maybe you know this this the concept of integrated reporting needs to be pushed a, a bit harder. I know Bursa has, has already started that. Right? I think IR is a journey that we're all undertaking, and I think it's fundamental that people understand what what builds their companies and takes it forward. I, I think if I can, I'm just going to refer to Asian Corporate Governance Association ACGA CG Watch List 2018 uh, Malaysia in 2016 was ranked number seven and moved up to number four in 2018 behind Australia, Hong Kong and Singapore. Now, is that, I mean, if, if I can, and I'll throw it open to the panel. No. To move up the rankings, important or not important? I mean, it's external validation, but really, is it what we do? Uh, I mean, it's externally validated by, of course, an independent party. But how we drive value, etc., is it important for this external validation or is how we feel about it as society, about what we're achieving and what the values that are important to us? Uh, thoughts? 
Well, external validation is uh, certainly good, uh, especially if you're running Bursa. <laughs> but uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, it, it, it really boils down to, to what society as a whole thinks, right? And, and what sort of values you have in, in society. Maybe YB Minister would, would uh, want to comment a bit more on this. 20 months almost when we are in government. <clears throat> there are many things that we see as a new government where we can improve processes. Gov uh, governance make or break the prosperity of any country. Yeah? ACG, Asian Corporate Governance, ranked Malaysia number seven, as you said. Then give me a question, what can we do better? If that external validation is so important, what can the government do to improve the ranking? Then you've got to give us the feedback. Now today, we have so many policies over the 20 months that we have drafted, crafted, you want to call it, yeah, and booked, and we are in the process of implementation. There are gaps that we see as government where things are not done at speed. Why? We look at governance. There are people, as I mentioned earlier, in the international scene, that I would say commit sins. They are big organizations. They are intelligent people, they are good people, they know what is wrong, what is wrong, and yet, governance are breached. So we, as a government, will, I would say, will make sure we hawk on it. And there are times when things have been done in the past, traditional way, does not follow the new governance that we want. So you notice a lot of outcome is not rich or is not achieved timely. Decisions are delayed. Maybe over governance or do not follow the governance. Case in point, perhaps I can quote an example. If someone presents to the cabinet, you may be telling half cook story. So decisions are delayed because you want to find out a bit more. And I remember one of the meetings that we have at a different council, and we start talking, hey, we better start to micromanage, which is not good. We are supposed just a team of policymakers. The micromanagement will be left to the people that I mentioned, the intelligent people, the people that we have selected, the people that have got values, people that we know will carry their duty diligently and according to the rule of law. But there are cases, there are cases where we have to do an oversight. There are cases when we have to ask more questions. Have you done this? Have you done that? This has got to be exhausted in order for decision to be it's in accordance what the people want, the way how we govern, the way we govern the nation. So from our perspective, we have these blocks. And we have this guideline established, SOP established, and looked at what are the SOP. Yeah, SOP of various companies like GLCs, like Brusa. We will make sure they are followed. That's why you mentioned earlier that most of the um, GLC, or rather GLC dominate the market cap in Brusa. And you have government representative in the board when it comes to board of directors. And it's very, very important for us to make sure, again, these are people's money, these are public money, these are investors that we need to protect through the right, and to thread the right rules and regulation, as well to make sure the people that have that value, the values that we have seen in the first instant, yeah, be appointed to form this corporate organization to bring about the best values from what the investors for stakeholding is concerned. Yeah? So, that's YB, uh, you know, as, as, as we pointed out, 60% of, of uh, the market cap of uh, corporate Malaysia on, on the listed companies is actually government-linked companies, government-controlled companies. So really, when you talk about corporate governance, they have to lead the way if, if we're going to get anywhere. Um, what's your view on, on how uh, the board 
of uh, directors of, of GLCs or even the GLICs that control these companies, the board, board members, the CEOs, how should they get appointed? Uh, you know, I know the government has, has mentioned, uh, the new government has mentioned that they do not want to see political appointees, but I, I think uh, we are still seeing that. What, what's, what's your your view on this? When I was first appointed as a minister, to not automatically say no political appointees. That's got to have professional qualification. So there are people with that have qualific professional qualification are in politics, I argue with it. So what do we do? You cannot put away professionalism or people that can run an association, for example, like Bank Rakyat, organization like Bank Rakyat. Do we do away just because he's a member of a party? Ah, then we talk about how then we manage the situation. One, in, one of the things that we, is, is not written as a rule as yet, is people that's holding top political position should not hold any position in GLCs or GLICs. Yeah? For example, in the case of Bank Rakyat, the transformation that you see, the previous board member or even the chair at that time are linked closely to politician, although he's not a politician. It's a very difficult situation to manage. In the case of Bank Rakyat today, we got criticism from people say, why you have to hire a highly trained people to help as a chair of Bank Rakyat? It is a difficult situation to manage. You got different people, got different opinion. But at the end of the day, it is a team that is managed by a leader. A leader may come from the government sector, may come from the private sector, that again, I must say, understand what the stakeholders want, what the shareholders want. So, um, again, I say I'm quite happy to see that Bank Rakyat has moved towards this direction. And I must say, there's no political appointees. Have we? Have we got political appointees? Tada. And we got people from dif different background, different qualification, representing the stakeholders that I mentioned earlier. I mean, Bank Rakyat is a corporacy. And we got people from different um, background and from different sector of the industry, and we try to put a balance and try to gel this what we call governance among themselves to deliver what they're supposed to deliver to the stakeholders. Yeah. What was the question? <laughs> uh, perhaps. You know, I was a, a, a kind of. Um, it was rankings, wasn't it? We well, you know we started with rankings and whether rankings are the yeah. be all and end all. Now we've moved from seven to four as a country. No, I ask the question then now: What can the government do to improve governance if they elect in government? Well, 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 I think I think the. Um, it I, goes back to GLC. I, I genuinely believe that politicians are best placed to know what to do in terms of government and policy. Very HSBC answer there. Um, so, 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 be call out to all the press in the room. Uh, well, I, I think it's you know it is very much the realm of politicians, and I'm sure that they'll, they'll do what is in the best interest in terms of their manifesto. Now, with regards to um, uh, what I think has been just generally good practice is what the Central Bank of Malaysia has done. And it's important to call that out, not just because I'm a CEO of a bank that happens to be regulated by the central bank. This is very important. There's two countries in Asia that have a majority independent board in banking. That's Australia and Malaysia. What that means is, is that the voting powers across all of the committees and the main board are, are in the hands of the independents. Um, the process to if the shareholder wants to look at removing the um, uh, directors, has a particular process in place, and it has to be on merit to remove them, that they can't do their jobs. And again, their appointment process. Now, the reason why that's there is that central banks have to do things in a certain way that works across all central banks around the world, so they learn a lot from each other. But also, um, the Central Bank of Malaysia has been extremely open in terms of taking lots of best practices including the idea of putting majority independence, the chairperson's independent, the, um, the 
nomination remuneration committee, the risk committee, and so on and so forth. So adopting such a process has certainly led to what I think is a very good banking sector within Malaysia. And one would imagine that if everybody goes down that type of route of appointments uh, where they're regulated in terms of having majority of independence, uh, especially of the chairperson, that seems to be a good way of doing it. Now, coming back to the rankings, I think that's a whole different question. And I want people to think about Maggie. And the reason why Maggie is very important in rankings is that all of us seem to know when something is overcooked, right? Especially Maggie. You always know when you've left it in too long. The question is, when we look at nations, we look at developed and developing, we don't look at overdeveloped. And overdeveloped countries are countries that perhaps have lost a bit of their soul, a bit of their happiness. Um, and I think Malaysia hasn't, and I don't think it should. So when we talk about rankings, uh, we want to rank ourselves, and I say that we, I spent a lot of time in Malaysia, so I like to look at it as we. We want to look at it in a way that's in line with many of the cultural values that we've had. And that is, a, that is around kindness. That is around having a happy life. I love the idea, um, and, and it's going away a little bit, that people in their holidays go back to Balak Kampung. That doesn't happen everywhere because people are connected back to their communities. So yes, we should go up in rankings where there are better things that could be done that would benefit, but at the same time, we can't just hold ourselves to getting to the number one spot when we're going to go into overcooked Maggie space. I think, I mean, as we talk about, oh, thanks, Oz, as we talk about embedding good governance, uh, about Six months ago, I was at a very similar forum, and um, mainly PLCs, uh, directors, and the chairman of one of the PLCs, I won't mention the name or the company or the space they're in, because you can actually work out who they are, made the comment that uh, corporate governance is overcooked. It's actually impeding the ability to make profit. Now, of course, that's a very... <laughs> A fairly bold statement to make. Now, I think it's, it's actually because I do hear this theme from time to time that we weren't able to respond in a structured. Uh, we couldn't respond quickly enough to to capture that opportunity. Now, frankly, I don't agree with that. In my mind, you have governance. You've actually taken the public's money. You have to follow it. But there was this push that. And this is perhaps touches on the idea of significant minorities, influence over board, etc. So it is a much wider space. But clearly, I mean, if I'm reaching out to yourself, Mark and Oz, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that could get really mucky very quickly. It's very important when you're dealing with public money, when you're dealing with an everyday person, let's be clear about who that everyday person is. It's the individual that works extremely hard to be able to provide for their family, they're able to save a little bit, they want to make the most of that because maybe they want to send their children to a good school, maybe they would like the idea of getting you know, something when they retire. We're not, talking about, you know, we're not talking about people with tons and tons of excess cash. So when we're talking about those people's money, we've got to treat it with the utmost respect and prudence. And that's what good governance is for. And we need to respect the fact that people go home every week thinking about whether they're going to save enough money to take their children on something that a vacation that their children are going to enjoy we have to really put that into decision makers minds and be clear that they wake up with that every day no, very there's much a so. separate point there's a separate point to enabling private capital to bring innovation to new sectors and being a bit lighter on that that's a very different point but what we should never do is paint it with one brush that there's too much regulation or there's, oh sorry, governance, pardon me, or there's not enough governance. I, th I think it's a, we need to have specific conversations framing the context clearly. Can, can I ask you, when you say overcooked governance, what does it mean? I think well, um, the, the, my point is um, anything that we do, we need to facilitate rather than uh, imposing roadblocks, right? If you do too much in terms of uh, putting a stop to any activity to progress, then I, I don't think that's real governance. Yeah. 
Uh, it, you say overcooked governance. What is no, it no, mean? I think overcooked governance in this instance, in this the form. requirement by Brusa, for there are people saying there's too much things to do in order to them to elevate themselves to the next level. It's just no. I, I think the, I think that's a very that's a very interesting topic. I mean, we're of the view that governance has to be appropriate. Now, in the other forum we had, the incidents, uh, the, the comment was they were chasing a transaction, were unable to complete because they had to follow the process. To, I go back to what, uh, if I may be, what Oz was talking about was you're trusted with people's money. You follow a process. You must. Now, in the same regard, of course, we, we at Bursa are the primary regulator. And we take that role very responsibly. I mean, we take that very role very seriously, and we're always watching and seeing. For example, um, the number of instant messages I received with the article regarding um, our friends in uh, Singapore doing away with quarterly reporting. Very hot topic about two days ago. Um, and for all of you, all of you in the room, and some of you did send me the same article numerous times. It's something we look at, and we always look at it. But at Bursa, for example, looking at quarterly reporting, some people think it is an onerous obligation. What we're encouraging listed vehicles to do is actually talk to their investors. Because we are aware that there are investors left to their own devices do not engage. And it's important that investors engage. It's the fundamental cornerstone of governance, talking to your investors and setting limits on what is appropriate conduct. And that culture. So, um, if if you like, we the exchange think we try and strike that balance between facilitation while also ensuring that the rules of engagement are very clear. That investors know what they're buying, and that's the fundamental piece. And if you like, for example, uh, building on was was sharing. When people invest, they want to know what they bought is what they bought, and you know there is risk. But in the same regard, if you want to move in a more risky space, there are appropriate products for that as well. I mean, Mark, thoughts? Well, um, when you talk about overcooked, I, I think perhaps it's really about application, how, how you apply. Uh, I mean, there are these rules which you need to follow. And maybe what that chairman was referring to is uh, instances, uh, for example, where uh, you have all these policies and procedures uh, for calling tenders, for example. And there's some companies which uh, maybe they have a procurement department that follows the rule by the book, and irrespective of the realities of what's happening on the ground with the project. And uh, there could be some tiny thing there that, that uh, causes them to uh, go and retender the, the, the project. And at the end of the day, what happens? The project gets delayed, company suffers losses. So it's about really how, how you are able to apply those rules in an efficient manner such that not only are you following the, the, the guidelines and policies and procedures, but really you need to look at the business as well. And, and, you know, we, we've seen, you, you can have all these policies in place, but at the end of the day, you need to make sure there is substance over form. You know, you could have all these tender procedures in place, but I've seen this myself, where companies, you know, they, they know that, uh, they know who may be out there that maybe uh, would benefit from, from uh, getting a particular project. Um, but they also know who might be the best uh, to deliver the project, but because there could be some hidden agenda, they, they could arrange the, the bids in such a way that, uh, okay, I have a very small window, and your friends are prepared to, to meet that small window, but the, the legitimate companies are excluded because they're, they're not able to meet the, those, that, that small window. I think that's a very, very interesting point, Mark. Substance over form. But at the exchange, we're very mindful. I mean, this is, in fact, it's my sort of management philosophy, not necessarily exchanges. That we're very wary of defining what you, we, we talk about the philosophy behind things, your beliefs. Uh, 
my favourite saying is, just because you can doesn't mean you should. Legally, you may be able to do something, but is it appropriate and is it consistent with your values? Can you sleep at night? And I really think culturally that's the kind of conversation we should be having. Uh, if we start looking at um, very much defining everything in black and white, the world is so dynamic, people will find ways to circumvent it, but if you get down to core values, you cannot circumvent core values. And then that becomes an overriding, becomes a whole theme about what we do and how we go about doing what we do. And I think that's when we get back to looking at um, governance and structures of governance, why be that it must be our value systems. Not we define what can. I mean, I'm sure we talked about 17A today, what we do, but really it's just getting back to behaving in an ethical and appropriate manner. And we can then put in structures around it but as society is now saying, we need this, and then is now being, if you like, supported by various initiatives of government. Yeah, why be your thoughts? I'm, I'm still, um, <laughs> the, yeah, no, no, say overcook. Uh, if I'm an investor, I come to you. I want to put money in, and you, you overall, we are ranked number seven, number four now. Okay, how do you? Tell me, uh, what will you tell me in the, in the context of governance? This is the company that you should be looking at. What are the, what are the parameters, so to speak? When you, or what would you tell me company A has got this and that? Or do you do that differentiation at Bursa? We, if I may, at the Bursa level, we facilitate the process. Okay. Not we're stepping away from it. So the actual ranking is undertaken by a third party. Now, what, what, what our driving force or what we, what we endeavour to do is educate. So there are two, two legs to it. As an investor, we empower you to ask the right question and understand the answer you're given. On the other side of the coin, we're encouraging and from time to time mandating that companies provide the necessary information that you can answer the question you wish to ask. We would not say good, bad, that's not the role. What we now do is we empower the investor, be it institutional, be it individual. Uh, you know, we, of course we have passive funds, which is a different story for a different day. But it's very much saying, what do you need to know? And that gets back to this whole question concept of quarterly reporting. How much information is too much information? Or is the information pertinent? Are we just, um, ha have we reduced ourselves to form? We're not providing the substance of the conversation. Then so I will not invest. <laughs> the question then becomes, is your advisor uh, versa? No, I, I think at the end of the day, there must be some Again, we go back to the governance issue. People want to see the representation of the culture itself. Business culture, corporate culture in Malaysia. You can't really pin down a specific corporate organization. When we have that culture, the simple word people will say, it is governed back, for example. I think that will attract investment. That's from my uh, perspective. That is why in the Ministry of Entrepreneurial Development, one of the things that we need to do, the challenges that we are overcoming, is to set the right mindset, to overhaul, not to say the overhaul. Today when you talk about governance, people tend to, to associate to bureaucratic process and giving excuses for not doing things on time, but perhaps they say we're going to do things right, we follow governance but people use governance as an excuse to slow things down. To me, there must be a differentiation. One is, one is governance, one is SOP, one is practices, and one is, of course, um, what I, I would say is bureaucratic process that to be observed. So they are, they are interconnected. So which is the best route that we should take? At the end of the day, the word facilitation is very, very important within the, the boundary of law, within the boundary of rules and regulation. And again, I must say, it goes back, no matter how tight the rules are, 
how well you return your SOPs in terms of governance is the value again on those people. If they have evil intention, because they are man-made rules, they can do anything to break governance. So, more importantly to me is inculcating the values into people that have, you have given trust. Well, I I cannot agree more. Yeah. And that gets back to that fundamental comment. Just because you can, doesn't mean you should. Because we can have rules for everything, but there will be still somebody smart enough to circumvent it. But if our value system is, this is how we want to behave to each other, this is what we believe in, then you will always get the right outcome in the absence of rules because people will do the right thing. Now, I'm not naive enough to think we live in this utopian place at this point in time and therefore we're on a journey which is then enshrined around a structure and rules and so on. But it does get back to that fundamental, that fundamental of inculcating the appropriate culture and belief. I asked a question earlier, earlier what else can, go, can the government do to improve governance? Assuming we all understand what governance. We have 10 minutes. I have not got the answer. And it, I need one. Government must do this. Government must do that. And we want the government to do A, B, C, D, E. Can you give some inputs for us to bring it up to the, the next level or to a different level to discuss this? Otherwise, I assume we are doing the right thing. We have governance in place. All perhaps we need to do now is to train people, to have an awareness program like this. So I want to do a takeaway. What is your um, recommendation, if there's any, how we could improve governance? You talk about political appointment, that's one of the examples. We are trying our best to do away with that. Um, perhaps you want to take away, Bank Riot want to take away their suggestion that the minister should not be taking charge of a bank. Yeah, There are some suggestions. So there's something that I need to learn from the private sector, from the uh, corporate organization. What the government can do better to improve governance if we are not doing the right thing? Uh, in fact, I was going to throw it to the floor. We have so many learned individuals in this room, but I think we'll lead by example first. Um, clearly, I think what we need to do is focus on values, and we, we're doing that. <coughs> I think there, there is a key, uh, I think we do really need to look at how we structure boards. <coughs> how we structure boards, uh, YB. Uh, it's about, uh, we should be looking at the talent, I mean, building what Mark says, we want to have diversified boards with different skill sets that look for the unusual. And it's not the unusual in transaction, but actually make the company ask the right question. There is no wrong question at a board. Every question must be answered because people look at things in a different way. And I think it's really uh, looking at corporate Malaysia today, its board composition is key. Now, I'm not saying do better, do worse. It is being mindful of it as and when we structure board composition. Uh, I also would suggest that perhaps when I look at uh, corporate Malaysia, I would like to see that the holding in large uh, GLCs be given back to market. Why? Because there is this uh, view that, one, there's illiquidity because they're tightly held. But more importantly, we want to see, uh, if you like, uh, I'm not saying the unseen hand, but you want to see that oh, clearly here is a listed vehicle, it has a, a very diverse shareholding, uh, government will always have a golden share on Telecom Malaysia or Tanaga, still has the ability to regulate through the regulator, but I think it's important to see these companies be seen, particularly by international investors, to have a, a, a very much more diversified institutional base. Um, I mean, just as an opening statement. Maybe, maybe also, you know, some uh, more, more effort on how uh, independent non-executive directors get, get appointed. Uh, a lot of the time, whether it's GLCs or, or uh, large corporates that, that have a dominant uh, individual shareholder, it's really about whom they know. 
that that's brought into the board as as opposed to having someone that, that truly could be independent and having the right skill sets i'm not sure how exactly this this could be implemented uh you know whether you you could have a, a register based on purely based on experience and skill sets that that uh you know the the board maybe could, could choose from rather than than being introduced just on a who you know basis Clearly, there are steps, Mark, to develop that talent pool, but I think it's a very interesting thing. Because clearly, if I'm a owner of a listed vehicle, I would have the moral hazard, why be, of wanting to put people who are sympathetic but independent to my views. And I think it's very important to try and how do we address that. Awesome. Yeah, so um, I think there's an offline discussion we can have. Um, the online discussion would be uh, just to give you an idea of what good looks like. So that's a truly independent board that does actually provide challenge, uh, meaning that the majority of positions on board should be independent uh, rather than have, allowing executives to stand on boards. The one thing that people are not doing, and I don't know, I, actually I do know how you implement this, um, the questions we ask is that, oh, does this person have the right experience? Show me the CV, oh, how long is the CV? What we're not asked is one dimensional. What we're not asking about is, give me an indication of your ability to think around value set, as in impact to society, impact to environment. What have you act what's your body of work that actually puts you in a decision-making point that I know that when you make a decision, you're going to be thinking of wider stakeholders because your body of work shows that? No. What we care about is the body of work in that particular bit and kind of ticks the box and... You know, so you need kind of more bolder, independent uh, board of directors that do provide challenge to shareholders, um, that do enable management uh, uh, to, to kind of inflex that change. And the way that that gets done is by a number of well-known bodies actually going through that change in a highly public way and people being looking at what that change my uh, others can follow. No, I think that's a very good point. It's not just a being a technocrat or technically competent. What we're going about is a whole new way of, uh, not, not a whole new way, we're inculcating a new value system might be. And uh, quite often, I mean, we've all done it, when we're looking at different roles, etc., in our organisations, even at board level, is uh, do you tick the box? Do you have the technical expertise? But perhaps what we should also be now asking the question, or we already are asking the question, what is your value statement? Where are you thinking? And it is not a question of alignment of thought. It is a question of saying, well, we, we have a much larger goal of shared prosperity and how are we going to go about achieving it? Because it's all about sustainable growth and outcome. Now, we, we, the clock is counting down. But with YB's indulgence, we have approximately four minutes. Do we have any questions from the floor? Please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm Dr. Ghazali. I was working in Islamic Development Bank before. I think the question is very important, but I can answer that the minister. When the Watergate issue was in America, they had a moral philosopher called John Rawls. And the question before the country then was defense of the regime values. I've attended this half-day session and I have not heard anything about the national philosophy of this country. We had a political philosophy called Rukun Nagara, but we do not have a civilization philosophy that binds all the sectors. I cannot imagine today to have a politician have another value, a corporate man another value, a media man and the value, you cause havoc to the common man. This business is the business of leadership. It is not the business of poor people. The poor people will think about the stomach and they cannot do good deeds when the stomach are not filled. Therefore, let me ask the HSBC, you know what's happening in Hong Kong. All the banks, sometimes they are culprits of the global economic system. Now, if you want to have a shift, Minister, the word is not reform. We have not used a very drastic word. In Arabic, it's called tajdid. In English, it's called transformation. This country needs transformation from what it is, good men leading the nation, not mere professional corporate people 
or even the directors who doesn't have a sense of the forces beyond cash. What is it? Commitment, consciousness, care and concern. If this nation have that, we don't need political masters. Thank you very much. That is the takeaway you are giving me. Okay. But at the end of the day, it goes back, you're right, it goes back to leadership. I can ask people in this room, if maybe some of them are not awake, do we understand Rukun Negara? Do we understand constitution? The fundamental of the, of the nation? Which leads to many elements in your organization if you take Malaysia as an organization. Leadership is very, very important. Leadership that brings about the best out of other people. Right? So, yes, I'll um, take your views. We'll try to correct it and try to sort of lead, lead it down to the people of Malaysia to have them... Uh, reform is, to me, is past. We have been talking about reform. Now, you said correctly. Anywhere I go, I said, Tun, we now... We are now talking about transformation, right? Kita sebut pasal hijrah from the past legacy that we are now inheriting or we have to abandon it and build a new one. Thank you very much for your input, sir. We have time for one last question, then we'll be wrapping up. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Dato Moderator, Panel Session Yang, Yang Berhormat Minister. Uh, my name is Lia Rahman. Uh, I was since the morning, I listened very interestingly to the views expressed by the panelists and even our Yamat Bromat Prime Minister talking about governance reforms. And all of us here agreed that it's very important for us to have the reform in the government institutions, which include uh, GLICS and also uh, government link company, GLC, listed and non listed. I have three questions that I would like to be addressed here. One is that uh, all the government institutions are actually now governed under the their different acts, which uh, we understand that they are really outdated. I was uh, in talking about the governance reform. Do you think it's timely for us to have a common code of governance for the uh, government institutions, especially the to start with, like it's, it's a journey, it's not a destination, especially the government-linked investment companies. Because the listed government-linked uh, government companies, they already have the code of corporate governance. Yeah, that's one question. Especially earlier, I think one of the panelists earlier mentioned about to be transparent and more power to be given to the uh, nomination, remuneration and audit matters. So it's quite important for when you talk about reform, you should have uh, maybe it's timely for us to have uh, uh, the, the code of common code of governance by all these institutions. My second question is that we talk about golden shares. And we're talking about governance reform. You know, it's definitely timely for, I think, the government to seriously consider uh, removing the golden share. The question is, will, is the government having the serious political willpower to do it, especially in the listed government link companies uh, in relation to the nomination of the chairman, the CEO, as well as the board members? My last question is that we talk about politicians supp not supposed to be on board as part of the governance reform. Kazana is having politicians on board. Why is there any exception? Why is there exception given to Kazana? Now we can talk about politic uh, governance reform. Maybe uh, the government should look into changing the constitution to ensure that there's no politicians on even Kazana board. Thank you.
my answer to Gazana, or rather a question relating to Gazana going backwards, let's privatise Gazana then. Let's privatise. Government, as Tun said, have no business to do business. But the intention was basically is to enrich the people through a sovereignty, sovereign wealth organisation. That's my take. Now, if public or the rakyat perceive that the transformation require everything shouldn't get government involvement, let's go for it. We are open about but today there are gaps that we need to plug and we have to remain in there. As you said, golden share. In certain sectors, yes, we need to have a golden share to avoid abuse of power. Because we are the force that govern the country. They are the force that protect people's money. Who else can do that? As I said earlier, they are big organizations that are run by intelligent people. What makes people cheat? What pe makes people break governance? Even the highest ranking officer will break governance. So there must be a team of, a team of lawmakers or a representation for lawmakers to oversee this. Yes, we have rules and regulation, but there are instances, they are bridge. So yes, I, I agree with you from the perspective for looking at uh, government should not be represented. That points to being a politician. And you're right, the Pagurusi, uh, the chairman of Kazana, he's the Dr. Mahade. But I, as long as they don't, they, they don't interfere with the business processes, that's the governance. I think my view is we should remain for a while for the government to hold the golden share. Yes, my wish is for the people, but as we say, they are potential of abuse. I'll give you a recent um, experience that we have, rather example. A GLC uh, CEO was asked to leave by the board. Yeah? And we know what's the reason. Because of conflict of interest by the board. A people that, has been, that we know has good values. We mentioned values. People that adopt good practices. People that have undertake mandates from the government. And the board decide to remove him. When we, do, when we did, if we, the government did not interfere, it remains unchecked. There are situations of conflict among board members and other stakeholders involved in the business equation, so to speak. Yeah? So we are mindful of the fact that the need for us to stay away from doing business, we need to facilitate. As is now, I take it that being one, by having one golden boat in government, is being facilitating to do the right thing. I'll be, I'm being positive about it, but there will be time when we have to do away with the golden boat. Now, I've forgotten the second or the first third question. Common code of governance, Swabi. Challenges for us to overcome. If you talk about uh, common code of governance, um, if you um, look from the perspective of the governing law, yes, we have law in place. But if you talk about governance per se, as I said earlier, different organizations have got different sets of governance. Maybe an engineering company will have a different set of governance. No, why, why uh, maybe um, Hong Kong Shai Bank may have different sets of SOPs. If you I, I think uh, what the question was referring to uh, are companies uh, that may be controlled by different ministries that don't fall under the ambit of, of uh, the listing requirements or the, or the common the, the code of uh, uh, governance. Corporate governance. Uh, I think there are exceptions to it. No, I, I think it's more of a question of having Some a, uni a, a universal code of corporate governance. We used to have the Green Book many years ago, yeah. and so on. We and working towards that. That answers the question. I, I think, Yang uh, Menteri, what what we are saying just now about the common code of governance is that so that absolute power should not be given to the minister or the ministry. So it should be. Uh, uh, the power to run the organization or the institution should be given to the board of directors. Thus, you need to have the right people to do the right job, not because of relationship or connection. Thank you. I don't think minister has got 
absolute power. I know Bank Rakyat, uh, for example, under the Act, the Minister is fully in charge of Bank Rakyat. It's under the Parliament Act. Then we have to bring to Parliament to make amends if necessary. But I don't think any other ministry in the context of having absolute power other than the Prime Minister being CEO of the country, I don't see any ministry that has got absolute power. We make policies, yeah? We make rules and regulation. The um, government officers, the executive, that will remain to implement that policies, whether or not there's a change in the government. Right? The government can change the policies, but the implementation remains with the government officer, the PTD. That's how I see it. I don't think we are imposing any... Um, you might, we are not, no, for example, today we have got secularists just to show government that minister should not get involved in procurement processes. So those that will try to get involved will break our governance, will break our code of conduct as minister. Okay? That's the transformation that we are heading into. If in the past it's perceived as that, now we are on the road of doing away with that. At least from my observation. Yeah? Thank you. Now, uh, no, no, I'm, I'm actually being told our time is up, might be. So I'd like to take this opportunity to, one, thank all of you for joining us with a conversation with Ansi Rizwan, YB Minister of Entrepreneurial Development. And of course, uh, I'd like to also take this opportunity to thank my fellow panellists, uh, Mark and Oz. We have, a, we have a view, we're somewhat an international panel today, YB. Uh, but I think uh, we've all enjoyed it. And if I could ask you to thank in the usual manner, which is actually clapping, <laughs> just in case. So thank you, everyone. Uh, we're done.